Baby, I'm back. <laughs> this is nuts. This is going to be the longest video I've ever made by far. I mean, what are we coming up on three hours or something right now? It's nuts. I just keep talking and I don't even know what I'm talking about. If I actually knew what I was talking about, it'd take me all day. Like I said, it would take probably two, three days to go through this museum. It's nuts. All right. Back to the matter at hand. Look at that B2. That, so we're going to find this out when you look at the placard, but this is an actual B2 test vehicle. Uh, it does not have engines. It does not have exhaust. It, it was built strictly for stress testing the airframe. So they basically built this sucker and uh, hooked it up to an apparatus with hydraulic, you know, levers, for lack of a better word all over the place and basically stressed it until it broke, you know, just so they could prove, verify, determine, uh, what the stress, uh, the, uh, stress, the airframe could take. Uh, it does not have exhaust, which is probably why it's sitting in this hangar right now. Um, exhaust is also like the air intakes, the air intakes and the exhaust are a big deal on stealth aircraft. Um, Maybe they figure the air intake on this thing is so high, no one's going to be able to see it. I don't know. <laughs> you think China could come with a selfie stick that's like 10 feet long and go take a picture of it? Um, but yeah, it has no exhaust, so it's safe to look at from the back, from a public standpoint. Um, yeah, exhaust is a big deal in stealth aircraft for the infrared signature aspect. Um I don't really get it, but you know, you want to dissipate that heat as much as possible, but you cannot destroy energy. It's physically impossible as far as we know to destroy energy. So the heat has to go somewhere. I guess the goal is to just distribute it amongst the aircraft as much as possible because there's no way to destroy it. You cannot get rid of it. Um, all right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a uh, Mustang sitting up front. I think that's what we're going to look at next. Yeah, there's the Mustang. Um, you know me, I'm more of a Chevy guy myself. Um, I'll take a C8 over a Mustang all day. All day. Hell, I'll take a C7. I'll take a C6 over a Mustang all day. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Yeah, it depends on the Mustang. Maybe I'll take a Mustang. But C7, certainly C8. Give me that Corvette, baby. Uh, you're talking Ford GT, I'll probably take the GT, but yeah, so they, this was a car that was commissioned, uh, I guess for the air force, it's commissioned the right word. I mean, it really drives I mean, that's a real engine there. Look at that. And then we, uh, oh, here's the placard, uh, showcase of U S air force ingenuity, state of the art technology and innovation. All right. Commissioned by the air force for recruiting. All right. Yeah, you can read that. Let's take a look on the inside. There's a nice uh, quarter panel look. There, look at that. I mean, <laughs> that's cool. Is someone really supposed to drive this thing with a freaking joystick? I I don't know. Like, you steer with a joystick. That seems incredibly unsafe. Uh, I, I feel like this thing would really take a, take a lot of getting used to. And, uh, I mean, they've got the seat in the middle, like the F1 McLaren, uh, but check out, I mean, those displays are just, ugh. I mean, I feel like, you know, the original enterprise has better looking displays than that, <laughs> you know, and this thing was built in like 20, what did it say? 2009, 2010. I mean, come on, man. Like. Those look like green CRTs from 1970. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. All right. There's, let's get back. Let's get back to why we're here. Yeah. There's the B2. You got some munitions that it launches, drops. Probably drops. Does the B2 launch anything? I, I could probably drop cruise missiles. I bet it can. Although I don't think I've ever seen it do that. Spirit of freedom, baby. 509th follow us. I don't know what the 509th is. Some kind of bomber squadron, I presume. Here's a closer look at some of the munitions it drops. I don't know if any of those are nuclear. Maybe the one in the middle is. No clue. The one on the right looks like your standard JDAM. 
In fact, I'm almost positive that's a 2,000 pound JDM. You can tell it's a dumb bomb. It's got the tail kit strapped to it. Uh, that's probably a, I bet half of my next paycheck. That's a JDM. <laughs> Here it is B2 Spirit. Global spread of sophisticated air defenses in the 1980s. Yeah, this plane is from the 1980s, which it's still the most advanced, capable bomber in the world. Can this thing fly over China undetected? Probably not. That's why we need the B-21. <laughs> so, no, I'm not going to say that. I just hope B-21 is going to get revealed on December 2nd. By all accounts, it is, it is the poster boy program. It hasn't gone over budget. Everything's worked. And uh, I'll just say this for the sake of the nation. I hope that's true because I'm rooting for it. I really am because we need it. And uh, go B-21. I cannot wait to see what it looks like. I cannot wait. Mark your calendars. December 2nd. It's going to be the B-21 rollout. It's going to be the first rollout from Palmdale, Northrop, since the B-2 probably, which was, I don't know, back in the 80s. I mean, that's how long it's been. And we only got 20-something B-2s. I mean, maybe half of those are combat-coded, ready to go at any given time. I mean, they want to buy hundreds of B-21s, and that's all. The B-2, when it was all said and done, cost over $2 billion for each copy based on the you know, R&D that went into it and the engineering, the low number – of procurement uh by all counts from what i've heard read uh the b21 is buck the trend they're on schedule they're on budget and the air force wants to buy hundreds of these things and i hope they do it because we need them in my unprofessional opinion we need them all right moving on there's more b2 placard yeah, structural testing, I think in here somewhere is where it says that the copy sitting before you today was not an actual flyable thing. They just built it for structural testing. And there's the front wheel and a whole bunch of people signed the landing gear cover. If you actually read what any of that said, you probably know why. Fire and ice. Oh, yeah, I think this was because of where they tested it. Maybe they tested it in a frozen hangar and then a hot hangar on the desert, something like that. Read the placard. It's all there, I think. And there's another view of it. You know, what always kind of gets me, like, take a look at the beak on this thing. It always, it's got a slight tilt downwards. I've always looked at that and been like, why? You know, does that, what is that little downward beak? It's very subtle, I think. Let, let me, yeah, it's there. This picture actually doesn't show it that well, but if you ever look at a B2 from the side, it's got a, it's got a little beak to it. And I've always wondered, like, what is the point of that? What did they design that to do? I mean, does that give it better radar cross section? Does that give it better fuel efficiency? Just that little that little thing. That's that's crazy. And then I, I've always and another thing about the B2. Look at that front nose gear. It is so close to the front, you know. <laughs> it's like, what is that, like a foot, two feet maybe from the tip of the beak? Like, that's close. I always wondered or always thought that that was so close to the nose of the airplane. I mean, if it was me, I feel like, yeah, let's move it back a little bit. But it might be crowding the bomb bay door or the fuel or something. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure there's a reason it's that far forward. And here's the back. Like I said, as you can see, there's no exhaust. Um, so this little extra hump they put in the back, I've read somewhere that, you know, it's the uh, cranked kite kind of design. Well, it's the flying wing design. Crank kite probably doesn't apply. I think that's more modern. But this uh, extra jut out in the back, I've read that came into the design very late because... The Air Force came back and was like, hey, we want 
stealthy characteristics for low altitude or something. And that was like a add on out of nowhere. And so they had to like redesign the tail of this thing. And I guess that, that jut out does that. I, I don't know. I, Maybe believe about 40% of what I just said. <laughs> I thought I read something, heard something along those lines. And uh, it, from what I understand, like without that, and, and it never flies a low altitude mission. Like that was a thing. Like the Air Force was like, hey, we need to be stealthy at low altitude. And as far as I know, this thing has never flown a low altitude mission. So it's been like, why did we do this <laughs> for the time and the money and I think it made the greater cross section worse you know overall it will I don't know if overall is the right word but like in its normal operating envelope it made the greater cross section worse just so they could put this caveat in for like low altitude stealth that the plane never flies so something along those lines I think is close to the truth moving on Ah, B-22 Osprey. So if you check some of my previous videos, uh, go back to the air show of 2022 in St. Louis. I actually did a walkthrough on the B-22 Osprey. Uh, this is the tilt rotor, aircraft, uh, tilt rotor aircraft. If you don't know by now, basically the engines on the wingtips the propellers, they rotate 90 degrees. They can go all the way up like now. And so you can take off like a helicopter. Then they rotate forward and you can fly like a prop plane. And so it gives you the best of both worlds in terms of, you know, helicopter maneuverability, short landing, short takeoff, and range of a fixed wind aircraft. Uh, the downsides to it are... These suckers seem to be unstable. There's been a lot of B-22 crashes. Um, and I think I'm pulling this out of my own head, but I think they lack a certain agility that regular helicopters have. You know, they're just not quite there in terms of regular helicopters. But these things are fantastic for transporting large numbers of troops, large numbers of equipment, you know, in areas without operating runways. So... They definitely have their niche. Definitely. This is actually a Boeing Bell product. And Boeing is competing against a next generation iteration of this design for the Apache replacement, I think it is. The um, the next, next version of vertical lift. Yeah, Boeing has a... Uh, by prop, that's not the right word for it. They got they got two propellers up up top that spin in opposite directions, and uh, the Bell submission for that contract is basically an upgraded B twenty two. All right, moving on. Uh, don't even know what I'm looking at here. Don't know what I'm looking at here. Although you can see the drones. Are those cruise missiles maybe? This might be cruise missiles hanging from the ceiling. Not not 100% sure. There is the Osprey from a different angle. CV-22B Osprey. Tilt rotor aircraft that combines the vertical takeoff, hover, vertical landing qualities of helicopter with the long range fuel efficiency, speed characteristics, speed characteristics of a turboprop aircraft. Read that at your leisure. Oh yeah. You guys know what that is? You guys know what that is? We're getting into it. If you don't know what that gun is, take a look in the background. It might, it might uh, give you a hint. That is the top machine gun for the A-10 Warthog. Yeah. Oh, that's a loader. That's just a loader. The GAU-8A Avenger Cannon. Ammunition loader. Yeah, so that's just the ammunition loader. <laughs> that's not the actual cannon. We're, we're going to get to the cannon. Just. Uh, oh, yeah. I took a picture of the placard. Here we go. Installed on the nose of the A-10 Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. 
more commonly known as the Warthog. 30mm cannon's most powerful gun ever fitted to a production aircraft. Firing 4,200 rounds per minute. Jeez, that is cooking, baby. The exceptionally potent Gatling-type cannon was designed to destroy tanks and hard targets. You know, the uh, U.S. Congress has been trying to put this thing out of service for like a decade and a half now, at least. I mean, this is like the perfect airframe for Middle Eastern, you know, no contested airspace. Um, probably not great for the Ukraine situation because this thing isn't even close to stealthy, but man, I would love it if we gave some of these A-10s to Ukraine. <laughs> Just let them go ham on some tanks. They probably wouldn't because, uh, like I said, they're not stealthy and Russia does not have air superiority, but, you know, Ukraine does not either. It's very, very contested airspace. Oh, but man, I would... These things could lay waste to some Russian armor. Absolutely lay waste to Russian armor. If you could get some like F-16 wild, weaser, wild weasels to, uh, you know, lay down some suppression and just let these things go to town, it would get ugly. I, <laughs> I'm I'm convinced myself, man. As pathetic as the freaking Russia, the Putin, or the, 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 as pathetic as the army that, Putin has rolled out. I'm convinced it'd take half a squadron of F-16s to just totally obliterate everything he has over there. All right. There's an advanced electronic countermeasures ECM pod designed to provide an aircraft self-protection against radar threats. Tell you what, there are some very smart people that put that thing together that know actually how that thing works. Very smart. Not everybody off the street can do what needs to be done to get one of those things built. There is the gun. Is that a drum magazine? Yeah, that's the gun. Yeah, that's the gun on the right. Here it is. It's even labeled GAU-8 Avenger. 30 millimeter Avenger. Uh, next slide probably shows the barrel. Yes, look at that thing. Oh, man. Scroll back. You know, rewind a little bit. Look at that. You know, this was, I think I've read somewhere that like, this is the only airplane in history where they like design or like picked the weapon system or maybe designed the weapon system and then built an airplane around it. <laughs> like, usually it's like, let's build an airplane. All right, what weapons do you want? This this was, no. Here's the gun. Let's build the airplane. <laughs> I mean, look at that thing, man. Jeez, look at those. Look at that barrel. Look at that barrel length. What was that? Like ten feet, twelve feet? That's freaking nuts. There it is from the front. <laughs> you know, I, I've seen there. I've seen a uh, tens before. They've been to air shows that I've been at, and it always kind of blew my mind. Or like, why is that off center? You know, I, wouldn't it be better for the airplane to make it on center? I mean, there's there's got to be a reason it's off center. Uh, maybe the recoil does something with the, uh, I don't know, the center of mat. I mean, maybe it making it off center. Like maybe there's the heavier part of the airplane on the other side that, I don't know. There's got to be a reason. I, I'd love to know what it is. I don't know what it is. If you know, tell me in the comments, please. Or I could Google it. You know, it's, it's probably on Google. All right, that's just a look at the loadout of all the other munitions the A-10 takes. It's a bruiser, man. It's a so the pilot he sits in a titanium bathtub, and that is because the whole the whole point of an A-10 is close air support. The CAS mission, the CAS close air support. That's when you got soldiers at the bottom or soldiers on the ground. They're taking enemy fire. They call in air support. This thing comes in. And uh, it's got to be very cognizant of danger close. That means, you know, you're dropping live munitions on very close to where your friends are. Um, yeah, and these things would take enemy fire from the ground. And so the pilot literally, sit, literally sits in a titanium bathtub uh, to block, you know, like a bulletproof bathtub. 
because these things are slow. They're flying low to the ground. But, uh, man, they're lighting, they're lighting things up when they're working correctly. And there's some pod hanging off the wing. I guess that's an AGM Maverick. Highly accurate 460-pound air-to-ground missile. Deployed on the A-10 F-16. All right. There's some more munitions. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the A-10 carries everything under the sun. Ah, this thing. I right, this. <laughs> oh, I was so happy to see it. I didn't even know this thing was here, honestly. I was just walking around. It's tucked away in the corner. You can you can even tell from this picture. It's just sitting in the corner of this hangar, like away from everything. I mean, this should be front and center. This is an iconic aircraft. This is the first stealth fighter ever developed. It's an F-117 Nighthawk. Um, yeah, so they put all these square faceted. Uh, they made it square and faceted like this. Not because that's what's required to make something stealthy, but that's because their computer systems at the time, I guess in the eighties could only like, they, they weren't fast enough. They weren't powerful enough to deal with all the calculations that went into stealthizing something <laughs> with curved surfaces. So with the computer, as far as I understand, what I've read, the, the faceted nature of this airplane is because of the limitations of the computers the designers were using when they created it. Um, yeah, that's that. I mean, you look at stealth aircraft now. You got the F-22, F-35, the B-2 even. Um, I guess that's it. That's publicly known. They're not square faceted like this. They have round edges because this thing was terrible. Aerodynamics and terrible at staying stable in the air. I, I've seen, I guess, some documentaries on this thing, and again, you know, this was bleeding edge technology at the time in the '80s, and they designed this thing to be, you know, radar evasive. And I think they came up with a pole model, maybe for some, because the USAF put out, you know, the call for. Uh, you know, we need stealth aircraft to counter, uh, you know, Russia radars, whatever, Soviet Union radars. And before that, like, nobody had really considered stealth. Uh, the, the Actually, the SR-71 was kind of stealthy. So it had the SR-71's verticals were uh, kind of tilted in, and that actually, for one reason or another, made that thing kind of stealthy. And I, I think the Air Force, when they put out the call, was thinking about something along those lines. And then Lockheed Skunk Works, hate to say it, but got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, they came up with this thing, or at least, you know, some faceted something like they, they, they put all the resources into, let's make the sucker stealth. And for what I understand, when they, when they gave this to the USAF, it blew their freaking socks off because it was way better way better than anything they were expecting to get. And they instantly slapped top secret label on it. And, but they, they took this airframe and it's like, look at this thing. This thing can't fly. You know, I mean, look at it. And so the air, aeronautical engineers were, you know, standing on their heads because we had this model, which was great in the radar cross section, you know, it was great in the, uh, in the, uh, you know, the range facility, doing the radar testing that the aeronautical engineers were like, this thing can't fly. <laughs> and I remember this quote, uh, from somebody when I was watching this documentary and he was like, we'll teach it to fly. <laughs> and, you know, enter the computers. I, and so I think the fly by wire system on this thing was probably more complicated, more advanced than anything that had been there in in the past even the space shuttle the space shuttle was fly by wire but you know the space shuttle was like you know aerodynamic this thing was not it was not i mean this thing is by all accounts very very unstable in the air and you have to have a fly by wire system you have to have a computer you know controlling its inputs and the same with the b2 the b2 is very unstable in the air with no verticals it has no verticals <laughs> It has nothing to keep it vertically stable in there. And so there there has to be a fly-by-wire system to 
you know, keep these planes in the air flying normally. And uh, I think that's, you know, the computer technology had to come along far enough for something like this to exist. I mean, they could have designed this thing, you know, 50 years ago, and it still would have sat on a drawing board because a person is not capable of doing everything that's needed to keep this thing in the air. All right, I've been talking about that for about 17 minutes, I think. So let's keep on going. There's it is. I I, I was pretty blown away when I saw this thing because I did not even know this thing was here. And I was like, holy sh! there's an F-117 sitting right there. Tucked away in the corner. Like, <laughs> why is this thing not front and center? I don't, I don't know. It, this is an incredible aircraft. It really is. They're still flying these things, by the way. They retired them. Retired in air quotes years ago. Um, I don't think they're flying any combat missions. I mean, there's definitely a subset of them. They're sitting in a garage or sitting in a hangar, not doing anything, probably being used for spare parts. But there's another subset that is absolutely flying. Um, not combat missions. I, I don't think they're flying to, you know, wherever and dropping bombs, but I think they treat these things as red air aggressor for, uh, you know, war games. They're still stealthy, and the advantage is, you know, the Air Force knows their radar signature inside and out from every freaking angle. I, this thing has probably been to a radar facility and literally irradiated from every single conceivable angle. So they know the radar signature on this thing very well. Yeah, and they can probably put new pods, new technology in it to do whatever. Yeah, so these things fly the aggressor mission. I don't think they're that fast. They're subsonic. Um, but yeah, still still in use today. I forget when they retired. I think the last time they were using combat was probably Bosnia. Is that right? I think that was Clinton. Yeah, Clinton. I think that was Clinton. Although, might have been a B-2. I, I can't remember. Anyway, they're retired. They're not flying combat missions now. Here it is. F-117A Nighthawk. Uh, yeah, response to Air Force request for an aircraft capable of attacking high-value targets without being detected. 1970s. All right. Like I said, you guys can read that. Oh, it was awarded the Collier Trophy in 1989. This thing might be older than I thought. Very early 90s. Okay, first flu in 1981. Jeez, I thought it was a little older or uh, younger than that, rather. Interesting. There's another picture of it. Front left quarter panel. Yeah, I think it could only carry like two munitions. And back then, this, this thing flew before GPS was big. So I think it mostly launched uh, laser-guided bombs. Rather than GPS guided, I think it could. I think it could only carry two of them. If we go back and read the placard, it'll probably tell you. But uh, yeah, these things were, and like <laughs> one of them got shot down. One of them did get shot down. Uh, again, was that Bosnia? I think that. Um, and everything I've read about that, I've not extensively looked into that, but everything I've read has been like that was. You know, a perfect storm of a lot of things going wrong. I think for starters, they were flying the same route to the target every day. So, like, the enemy, like, knew where they were coming from, where they were going. And I've I've heard that's a big no-no in, like, modern combat. Like, you don't fly the same route because people will learn it, you know. Um, anyway. And there's the tails. I always thought that the, the uh, tail, I guess the verticals, are those called verticals? I'll call them verticals. I always thought they looked a little too small for the whole plane. <laughs> like they put the suckers out there. They're like a, a canted angle. And they're, look at them, even the tail. You can see how many facets are in the tail. So they got like, even the tail's got a little part that sticks out a little bit. That's interesting. Like why do that? I don't know. I always thought the tail was weird on these things. All right, moving on to the iconic F-15 Eagle. Look at that sucker. That's an F-15. Yeah, it's definitely an F-15. I'm going to have to erase this audio. <laughs> There's the uh, gun on the F-15. Not quite up to the G 
eight U A whatever it was on the uh, A ten. This is a child's child's play compared to the A ten. Look at that front profile. That's pretty sinister looking. So yeah, if you go back to the F twenty two, you can see a couple of differences right off the bat. This one does not have that canar or uh, it's canar. Canar is probably the wrong word, but the uh, the the chin, the uh, chin line. That's that's what I'm looking for. So this is a barrel, you know, it's barrel front fuselage all the way around. That's very good at reflecting radar, uh, you know, electromagnetic energy. And the intakes on this thing, uh, I bet if you look down in there, you can't quite see from here, but if you look down far enough, you're going to see fan blades for the jet engines straight ahead. That's a big no-no for stealth airplanes. So that's two of the big things. So they, they've redesigned the Eagle. In fact, this might even be one. I don't know. Um, do they ever build a silent? I think they build a silent Eagle. I have no idea what went into that, but it was supposed to be a more stealthy F-15, but... You know, apples to apples, it's nowhere close to F-22, F-35. Moving on. Ah, there's the F-15A Eagle. Twin engine all weather. Yeah, one cool thing about this, it was the, uh, I think I mentioned here. So the engines, this is probably more of the engines than the plane, but it, it produced more thrust than it weighed. So it could actually accelerate vertically. And that was the first, I believe, airplane that could do that. So you could get an F-15 and accelerate flying straight up. And nobody else can do that. Except for the F-22 at the time. So I think F-22 can do that also. And I think those are the only two planes publicly known that can do that. Um, yeah, second sentence. It was the first... U.S. fighter with engine thrust greater than the basic weight of the aircraft, allowing it to accelerate while in a vertical climb. Yeah, that's nuts. That's freaking nuts. Uh, the F-22 can do it too, but this was the first one. So hats off, F-15A Eagle. That is another MiG. <laughs> Look at that we got. We got MiGs. Putin could take a freaking tour of this museum, huh? Yeah, that's a MiG. Uh, I don't know what MiG that is. Is that a fulcrum? I think that might be a fulcrum. Fulcrum? Yes! Hey, check me out. I know. I know my MiGs, baby. <laughs> Starting to learn them because of this freaking war. Uh, yeah, fulcrum ray, MiG-29. Yada, yada, yada. Read that if you want. More stuff on the MiG. Cold War. Yeah, this is an actual picture of the MiG, so check that out on the left. Um... Looks like damage. I think, uh, you know, <laughs> whoever, where'd we get this MiG? Yeah, probably unless somebody just like defected, gave it to us. Maybe it was shot down or something. Yeah, it looks like there's some damage on the, you know, it just almost looks like there's twist ties holding it up or something. I don't know. <laughs> Moving on. I don't know what that is. Something camouflaged. Got some drop tanks. No, no, no. Actually, take that back. I don't see any drop tanks. I see some laser guided bombs, I think. Air to air missile on the right there with the fins in the front. Uh, don't know what that is. Is that a MIG? No, I don't think that's a MIG. MIGs don't have teeth painted on them. <laughs> don't know what that is. Oh, MIG flogger. Dude, how many MIGs? Jeez, might as well call this the freaking MIG Museum. What's another MIG, huh? 23MS Soviet built MIG flogger designed to replace the widely used MIG 21. Okay. Knock yourself out. I don't know MIG history that well. This, so th they had a little section on uh, the uh, Berlin Wall. That's what this was about. Uh man, can you imagine? I I mean, this is what Putin wants. He wants an empire where there is no individual in the entire thing. They're all part of the motherland, the country. It, they're all part of his group. It, it's the Borg, man. You guys watch Star Trek Next Generation. It, Putin and communism... At least I use communism loosely because it's not even communism. It's a dictatorship. 
they're the board. You know, it's a simulate or die. You need to give up any kind of personal ambitions, any kind of personal freedoms. I mean, you no longer have an individual identity. He expects you to give and do everything for the good of the state, a.k.a. him. And that's what this was about. And it's just, I can't imagine living there. So I think they had this. I'm I'm trying to think before I read the placard, which I'm not going to do on camera. Um, I think, I think, I think that like a sign like this predated the Berlin Wall where it was just like, hey, you're leaving the American sector. And then I think the Soviets realized that everybody was freaking fleeing the Soviet sector. And that's when they decided to put up the wall. <laughs> I think. Uh, what's the next picture? Yeah. Uh, I'm still not going to read this. You, you can pause and read this. Yeah. East Berlin for a showcase for the, for the success of socialism. Yeah, bullshit. Uh, yeah, shops, department stores. So basically, yeah, it was all charade. Uh, you go to the cesspools of the world, it's all a charade. I mean, I'm sure Moscow is beautiful. Uh, yeah, I know uh, Pyongyang is beautiful in North Korea. The rest of the country is a cesspool. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, if you read that placard, here's the car they were talking about. <laughs> so I, I guess communist Berlin, Russia had one car manufacturer and this is what they cranked out when you could get one because supplies were extremely low. And that thing just looks like something I don't want to drive at all. Here's an actual piece of the Berlin Wall. Look at that. Pretty cool. And concrete symbol of the Iron Curtain. Yep. Yeah, look at that. To stop the exodus, hold on. To satisfy <laughs> with the economy, West Berlin, the only gap in their current. To stop the exodus of the nation's elite, doctors, teachers, engineers, professionals. Hey, ring a bell for the people leaving Russia right now. East German government government sealed the border between the east and west during the pre-dawn hours. Man, so they just rolled up there and built the wall. Wow. East German troops, workers, backed by Soviet tanks, ran barbed wire, built barricades, heavy concrete. Yeah. yeah, so I guess they didn't used to have a wall until they realized all the smart people were leaving their hole and they were like, hey, we're going to force them to stay here. All right, there's some kind of radar. Here's the business end of an SR-71. I do think, yeah, baby. So they got an SR-71 there. In fact, they had two of them there. <laughs> this was the actual SR-71. They had another one later on that was like a predecessor something or other for uh, the SR-71, kind of like an experimental aircraft. I mean, they looked the same to me. If you showed them both to me, I couldn't tell you the difference. Uh, yeah, so this that cone up front, would extract in or out, depending on how fast the plane was going, to put the jet engine in an optimal state for air consumption, I believe. That is all I can tell you off the top. And probably about all I can tell you, even if I read the description. <laughs> I am not an aero guy or a jet engine guy. That's a cool picture. That's... Flying the SR-71. All right, you know what? I'm going to cut it off here. It's getting late. I cannot believe how long I've been talking for. This is going to be my longest video. This video might be five hours long. <laughs> I've kind of had enough for today, so we're going to pick this up tomorrow. Flying the SR-71. I will see you then. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, sorry for the weird cut. But it's been like four weeks, five weeks since I picked this back up. <laughs> I had a pretty good run at these pictures and then I got really busy and 
now I'm just starting to get back to it. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to forget everything I said in the first session. I do remember that I talked for a long time and I actually wrote down this was the picture I left off on. So I apologize if I repeat myself, but you know, can't remember that far back. Let's jump into it because this is already super long. So here we are flying the SR-71. So yeah, I remember this was my uh, trip to the USAF Museum in Dayton, Ohio. There was an SR-71 sitting there. I took quite a few pictures of it because that's an iconic plane. I should say the iconic SR-71, the legendary SR-71. I think I mentioned it last time, but one or more of these signs mentioned it still holds speed records as of March 20-something. That's hard to believe. (laughs) I hope that's not true, at least in the public in the uh, or in the uh, private space. I hope that's not true in the black space, classified space. Anyway, in the public space, it probably still holds some records. But let's see what this sign says. Uh, operational, uh, in the time I've talked, you've probably been had a chance to read that. So let's move on. Cold War necessity. That's the truth. Yeah, so what was it? Uh, I'm going off memory here, but, you know, we had the U-2, and that sucker was... Super high flyer. I believe the pilots had to wear, you know, the compression suit, oxygen mask, the whole deal to fly that thing. It was like, what, 80, 90,000 feet? And then the Russians, or excuse me, the Soviets, I mean, is there a difference these days? Shot it down. And the government decided, we need something better than a slow U-2. And cue the SR-71. Um... It was incredible. Just an incredible plane. There's so many new technologies that went into this. I, I think, like, number one being it was made out of titanium, which was unheard of in those days. They had to get totally new tools because, you know, titanium is extremely tough. Uh, so that, I mean, just that. You, there's so many things I, I'm trying to remember because I read about this a very long time ago, but uh, it's just incredible. It was an incredible plane back in the, what, 60s, 70s when they built this thing? Uh, I haven't even read the picture yet. Hold on. <laughs> Single seat A12. So yeah, from 1967-68, flew classified missions under the name Black Shield, spying on missile sites and military activities in Southeast Asia and North Korea. <laughs> These days, it's hard to believe that you know you need a plane this advanced to fly over North Korea. I don't know. North Korea does have some does have some air defenses. Anyway, moving on. Engineering marvel. That, that's the truth. It, it's probably, if they built this thing today, it would probably still be pretty close to an engineering marvel. Uh, yeah, higher and faster than any aircraft in existence. Yeah, the Russians, they at the time, they did not have a missile that could shoot it down. And that, now they do. It's partly why they retired it. I'm sure it's, uh, you know, missiles fly very much faster than this thing did. And surely very much higher. Uh, yeah, read about this thing, man. It required solving extremely difficult technological problems. That's, <laughs> that's a stretch. And my apologies if I mentioned this before, but on the ground, they fill this thing up with fuel on the ground and it would leak like a sieve because the engineering tolerances they had to make for it, they, you know, they designed it for going Mach 3. And when you go that fast, everything heats up and expands. And so on the ground, it would leak fuel because it was, you know, it, it was so loose on the tolerance, uh, if that's the right word. Uh, it didn't start, you know, behaving up to up to spec until it got going really fast. So they'd fill the thing with fuel on the ground. It leaked all over the place. It'd take off. The first thing we'd do is refuel when it got in the air, as far as I know. And then get going and, you know, it start heating up, expanding, tighten up. Uh, was this a sign? Yeah, aerodynamic friction at high speed heated the plane to 600F. That actually sounds kind of cool. When using the afterburners, yeah, it would get to the cowlings. So those are the the cowlings, I think, are the cones in the front. So those cones in the front are what made this thing because it. I'm not a jet engine guy at all. <laughs> Here's all I can say about that. So the pointy cones on the front of the engines, they'd move forward or backwards, I think, to adjust the airflow into the engine. And you'd 
it, it, basically it would give it would uh, provide optimal airflow based on the speed, which changed based on the speed. That's about all I know about that. I don't know a thing about engines. Um, in order to reduce visibility on radar, engineers made extensive use of plastic laminates. That's interesting. See, see I didn't even know back then they were really concerned about radar. I know the the uh, inward slanted verticals. I think it's like 15 degrees. That helps with uh, radar signature, or radar cross-section, RCS. Um, yeah, I read a book about skunk works when I was growing up, and I'm trying to remember one thing. There was an engineer who wanted to paint the entire plane black. And Kelly Johnson at the time, he was the lead of skunk works, you know, the legendary Kelly Johnson. He basically bitched this engineer out. It's like, oh, it's so stupid. It's going to add, you know, a thousand pounds of weight, blah, blah, blah. And he came back the next day and apologized because he realized, I think the black paint was going to dissipate a bunch of heat was the idea. You know, black colors, dark colors, they absorb heat, but I think they also dissipate it faster than light colors. You know, when you're flying this thing at however freaking cold it is at 90,000 feet. Um, and yeah, I guess overnight Kelly Johnson decided that the black paint was worth it, even though it was going to add such and such amount of weight. <laughs> <laughs> and he apologized to Ben Rich. Uh, it's it's funny that you remember. Moving on. Oh, here's the engine. Okay, J58 engine. Yeah, powered by a unique engine, specifically, specially, excuse me, developed fuel. Wait, the SR71 is, was powered by a unique engine and specially developed fuel. There it is. I <laughs> didn't know if we were talking about engine or fuel. Maintain Mach 3. That's crazy. Um, man, I'd have to ask my brother. How fast does a normal bullet go? I mean, I know bullets go different speeds. Uh, most of them are faster than the speed of sound. I know you can pack them, shoot them, but, you know, if you're trying to be stealthy, <laughs> uh, that are slower than the speed of sound, they're subsonic. But I don't think many bullets are going Mach 3. I mean, this thing literally flew faster than a speeding bullet. It's Superman coming to life. That's crazy. That is freaking crazy. Uh, and this was back in the 60s, you know, late 60s, early 70s. Um, you know, Lockheed uh, has made a big stink in the press a few years ago, actually, about the SR-72. Back then, they said they were still test flying this thing. And you, if such a plane exists, I mean, it exists. They're, they're openly talking about it in the press, so it definitely exists. Um, you got to believe that thing is at least, at least Mach 5, at least. I mean, there's no point in even building one of these things if it's not hypersonic at this day and age. No point. Uh, so that thing is at least going Mach 5. And the uh, the engineering challenge there is, so <laughs> all the propulsion folks are going to uh, bite my head off for this, but I'm the thing about... The, uh, the mock, you know, the hypersonics, uh, the engines they have, the air breathing engines they have. So yeah, I can back up a little bit. Uh, we've been flying hypersonic for a very long time, but not on air breathing engines. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the new technology here. Yeah. You can strap a rocket to something. It'll, it'll get you to Mach five and no sweat. Uh, but you're limited on fuel in that case. Cause, um, yeah, you gotta provide your own accelerant. Whatever burns your own oxygen, probably well. All right, I better stop talking before I make an ass out of myself. Um, but the air breathing engine part is what's new, so that's what's going to give you the long range. The you know, you don't have to bring your own. Uh, oh man, I can't even think. Chemistry teacher would be kicking my ass right now. Um, oxidizer, there it is. <laughs> is that what I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, when you're breathing air, you don't need your own oxidizer. Um, and yeah, the air breathing engines that fly super fast have to be going super fast in order to work. You get a real catch 22 there. <laughs> so basically if you're going to design an end to end plane that can take off from standstill and go up to faster than Mach five, you're going to have to have some kind of system that, you know, probably flies a regular jet engine from, you know, zero to Mach two. And then from there, 
the scramjet needs to take over or the ramjet. And uh, I don't know the difference between those. I think a scramjet might. No, I'm not even going to speculate. I used to know the difference. Maybe it'll come to me. But I don't know off the top of my head. But if you're going, you know, if you got, like I said, if you got a plane going from zero to Mach 5 and above, you need some kind of trade off on those engines. And I guess preferably an engine that can do both. So I'm sure whatever the SR-72, as Lockheed calls it, has, it's freaking nuts. Um, I don't know. It's uh, they, They've talked about it. It was like three, four years ago they made a mention in, it, in the press. And they were like, yeah, we're doing test flights and the whole thing. And as far as I know, they haven't said a word about it since. So very strange. Anyway, I presume you guys have had more than enough time to read this. Yeah, intake air had to slow down. Yeah, that, that's it. That's one thing about jet engines. They don't like supersonic speed or supersonic airflow. So in the jet engine, even when you're flying faster than Mach 1, the engine has to be designed in such a way to slow that air down. And that's, that's a, one of the, I'm sure, many differences between a regular jet engine and a scram ram jet. Uh, the scram ramjets want that hypersonic speed or that supersonic speed or uh, supersonic airflow. <laughs> there it is. Uh, yeah, that's about all I can speak on that. I got to pick this up because we're already going super freaking fast. Yeah. All right. So here's a breakdown diagram or slow. Sorry. Super slow. Here's a breakdown of the engine in its different states. So yeah, the spike up front, as you can see, used to retract and uh, spike forward. <laughs> What's the opposite of retract? Expand? I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you can see it. So Mach 0, 0.0, the spike was all the way forward. And then we start going, getting up to Mach 2.5 and it starts retracting, I guess. And then Mach 3.2 and higher, it, I guess it retracted all the way in. And whatever that did... Center body bleed overboard. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know. All the engine propulsion folks out there, I'm sure this is a shining, shining moment for you. All right, back to the pictures. Jeez, look at that thing. I read in a book, that same Skunk Works book, you could cut your hand on the side of that fuselage, and I believe it. Look at how sharp that thing is. Don't forget, this is titanium tooling in the 1960s. <laughs> That's what you're looking at. Incredible, incredible. I mean, look at it. It's a knife's edge. You could probably cut your hand on that. I didn't reach out and touch it. I probably could have. That rope is not that far from that thing. I probably could have touched it. Look at that. There's nose on. You know, almost. That's what I was going for. A little, uh, little to the left. But man, look at that profile. That thing is a, whew, that's a butter knife. Just whew, coming right at you. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can look at that thing and just know it's stealthy. Like, there's not much. I mean, imagine the wheel up. There ain't much that's going to be bouncing off and coming back to cinder on that sucker. It is, uh, yeah, that little, uh, the, uh, nose up front, which the name is eluding me now. I think that does like airspeed and probably some other things. I mean, that's like the only thing. What else is, well, the uh, jet engine, maybe. Well, yeah. All right. The jet engines are going to be reflective. You can kind of tell on that. But man, that sucker is sleek. That is sleek. It's just incredible how fast that thing went. Yeah, that's our 71 nose section. Here you go. So all the sensors and things. So this was a spy plane, ISR. That's uh, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. That was its only job. It did not carry weapons. Uh, from what I've heard on the SR-72, it does ISR and strike. At least, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the Chinese are the only country, people, who have publicly released a payload from a hypersonic vehicle. That's a little unnerving. I hope we have in secret. Anyway, point being, yeah, uh, the nose cone is where all the sensors went on this sucker. And there were, it was sensors, not weapons. Yeah, so what do we got? Interchangeable noses carrying different types of sensors. One type carried optical cameras, photographed small targets, or a wide area. At Mach 3, 
These cameras could cover over 100,000 square miles in an hour. That is crazy. It's just, it's hard to believe how fast this thing went. I mean, it's set every freaking record. You could fly from the East Coast to the West Coast and uh, watch the sunrise, I believe. I think I remember reading that. You know, you get in a regular airplane, fly from the East Coast to the West Coast, you're still going to watch the sun fall below the horizon because you're just not going that fast. But in this thing, going my 3.2 and higher, you're going so fast, you will actually fly west and watch the sun rise in the sky. <laughs> I think that's correct. And I'm not sure what we got there. Nose cone, I guess that's where sensors went. I think on the left there, that's part of the engine, probably without the uh, the cone, cowling, what do they call that thing? The thing that went in and out. It's crazy. And here's the sign on it. Uh, lucky delivered 24 year career. Yeah, here we go. SR-71 remained the world's fastest and highest flying operational aircraft. From 80,000 feet, it could survey. Uh, oh, I thought this is where they were going to say it still held the record. Clearly not. All right, moving on. Ceiling, 85,000 plus feet. That's crazy. You can see the curvature of the earth from up there. One day. I just hope I live long enough to see uh, hypersonic commercial airplanes. Because that's the altitude. This is the altitude altitude where they will fly. It's going to be 80 plus thousand feet. And up there, you're basically in space. It's, well, you're way more in space than you are at 35,000 feet where airliners fly today. Up there, you see the blackness of space. I don't, you're not seeing a blue sky anymore. You're already above that much of the atmosphere. And you are definitely seeing the curvature of the earth. And, uh, man, fingers crossed. I just... Hope I live that long. <laughs> There's one of the engines. Incredible. Somebody knows how that things works. And uh, it's not me. <laughs> I don't know. There it is. J-58 turbojet. 1950s. This thing, so you got a 1960s plane powered by 1950s engine, and it still holds all kinds of records. That's nuts. That is freaking nuts. Designed to operate at speeds of Mach 3 plus, altitudes of more than 80,000 feet. I mean, there's just not that much oxygen up there, right? I, it, I can't, there can't be that much oxygen up there. Yeah, first engine to operate for extended periods using its afterburner. Wow, I did not know that. So these suckers were flying on afterburner the whole time, huh? It's just crazy. There's so many new technologies that went into this thing. It powered an SR-71 to a world altitude record of 85,000 feet. And another SR-71 to a world speed record of 2.8. 1,000 miles per hour. <laughs> wow. It's fast. All right. Yeah, there's the uh, the cone thing. Gosh, I I want to back up a few pictures <laughs> and try to remember what that thing was called. Yeah, that thing would extend in and out based on its speed, based on, yeah, based on speed to get the proper airflow to the engine as far as I know. That's all I know. And there's the business end of the SR-71. Uh, if that thing was an afterburner most of the time, you don't want to be hanging out back there. I wonder what the uh, significance of the tiger on the vertical there is. I think that's a tiger. This is... Oh, we're switching gears now, I guess. <laughs> you know, I remember a few times when I was taking pictures, I'm like, I need to go back and, you know, reorder some of these things, but I can tell you I'm not going to do that. I've already got hours of audio recordings for these pictures, and I'm going to have to go through and make this video switching between each picture at the right time based on my audio cues. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be, this video is going to be the longest, most involved one I've ever made. But anyway, that's uh, B2 from the rear. <laughs> I guess I was walking by and thought, hey, this is a good looking picture. 
All right, moving on. Back to SR-71. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know how that B-2 picture got in there. All right. Uh, oh, this was the, uh, yeah, I never, so what we're looking at here is a drone, I think. I never knew this thing existed, and I believe the next picture is probably a sign about it, so let's go to that. Nope, more B-2. What? <laughs> I was just bouncing back and forth. These things were close together. Yeah, you can, sorry. So you can see the drone thing on the below this wing. That's why. That's a pretty sweet picture, though. So that's wingtip. Look at that. That's only half the plane. Look how long that thing is. Uh, yeah, I apologize if I said this in the previous video. Um, but I think I'm going on memory here. The wingspan on this thing is 172 feet. And uh, the, uh, the, the bat wing design is not is not uh, bleeding edge so jack northrop you know northrop builds this thing uh he had an idea back when he was you know as brilliant as he was and running the company uh he had an idea to build a plane basically that looked just like this because uh, he knew I, I think there's some um oh what's the word advantages I think I think the flying wing design is very aerodynamic. That's what I'm trying to say, and it's very fuel efficient. And they knew this back in the, you know, I don't know, 50s, 60s. I'm making that date up. It was at least that long ago. And Northrop actually built a flying wing back then. You know, I, it, it wasn't stealthy, so to speak. It you know that wasn't even on the radar, pun intended, <laughs> back then. Um, yeah, I, th I think it was, I'd have to Google it, but I think it was basically a flying wing and it had props in the back, it had like pusher props in the back. And uh, they built this thing, but it, they couldn't make it work because it was so unstable. I mean, it, this airframe design, especially with no verticals like this thing has, is extremely unstable aerodynamically. I mean, no verticals make it extreme. And you, you need a computer to constantly do corrections you know so you have flaps and rudderons and ailerons you know i'm totally going to get a lot of this wrong <laughs> uh, but basically you have a computer doing you know corrections and all these control surfaces to keep this thing stable and back in the 50s 60s when jack northrop designed his you know there were no computers essentially or they sure as hell weren't flying the thing uh you know that's Basically, this so you couldn't have this kind of airframe before fly-by-wire, essentially, because there's just no, even the best pilots in the world. I mean, that thing will make, you know, hundreds of corrections a second to keep this thing stable. And, uh, yeah, your best pilots in the world obviously aren't doing that. And uh, so back in the, I keep saying the 50s, whenever it was, Northrop built this thing, and they demoed it, uh, and the Air Force was intrigued. But I think they ultimately canceled it because it was just, I think they might have had a crash during testing. And don't quote me on that. But the Air Force knew how totally unstable this thing was. And they were just like, nope, good idea. Wait 50 years, we'll try again. So fast forward 50 years, <laughs> 40, probably 40 years. Because this, you know, this thing was, was designed in the 80s, I believe. And they built this thing and Jack Northrop, was on his deathbed, literally. And they walked into his hospital room. I mean, he was long retired, you know. And they showed him this design. He wasn't even cleared for the program, but they were like, they, they made a super exception, <laughs> from what I understand. And they showed him this design. Because even back in the 80s, back then, they, the computer, the computing power was enough where you could have fly-by-wire and it could stabilize this thing in flight. And the wingspan on this thing is exactly the same as his original design. So he was kind of ahead of his time in that regard. He knew exactly, you know, what was good and aerodynamically sound. And they basically copied it. I'm sure they made some modifications to make it stealthy and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's eerily similar. So if you go Google, I'm not sure what you would Google, Jack Northrop original flying wing or something. You'll see a picture of an airplane from the 50s that looks very much like a B-2. <laughs> All right, moving on. D-21. All right, this must be the drone that we looked at two pictures ago. 
I, I just kept bouncing, bouncing back and forth, bouncing back and forth. I, I'm not going to reorder these, especially since I've already laid down the voiceover. Uh, yeah. Highly advanced remote piloted aircraft. That's crazy. Back in the what, 60s, they had drones. I, uh, how? I, that's nuts. That's nuts. Use technology from the Blackbird family. D-21 was powered by a ramjet. Okay. Uh, man, what's a ramjet? It's the same. I I should have done some Googling. I don't know the difference between ramjet versus scramjet versus... Is there another one? <laughs> Using on four flights over communist China under the codename Senior Bowl. None of them fully succeeded. What does that mean? They crashed in China? Ugh, freaking China. That's a sweet picture. Look at that. Freaking head on. Head on. All right. And there's the rear side. Oh, this is must be the nose cone. So this must be, yeah, the opened up the nose cone where all the sensors. So I guess all the cameras and sensors and radars and whatever else they wanted would fit in that nose. I mean, in that regard, it's probably pretty modular. You put whatever you want there. Pull off this nose, pop on another. I mean, that's pretty much what they want to do today. If you look at the sign here on the left, the 85,000 feet, you can see the uh, space suits. If you look below that, you can see the space suits the guys are wearing. So those are pressurized suits. Uh, yeah, they're essentially space suits in an airplane. There we go. Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. Look at that speed. 2,193 miles an hour. Hold on, I got to zoom in so I can read this. I hope you guys, you can do that in the video too. So it, if you look to the right, it went from the Statue of Liberty to London, Big Ben, London, in 114 minutes. <laughs> so what is that, an hour and... I'm not going to embarrass myself with that math. 114 minutes. <laughs> Almost two hours. Yeah, okay. So 120 would be two hours. So an hour and 56... 56 minutes. That's correct. An hour and 56 minutes. I'm pretty sure that's correct. That's crazy. Oh, 54. No. Wait, what? I did the math wrong. An hour and 54 minutes. Shouldn't that be 116 minutes then? Something isn't adding up here. If I do 120 minus 6. Oh. Yeah, never mind. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> I'm the one who can't do math. Sorry, folks. I'm slow. I am slow. I should probably edit some of that. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Faster than a bullet. Yeah, if you go down below that, 3,000, yeah, 3,200 feet per second. I guess your average bullet goes 2,900 feet per second. This thing is literally Superman. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Man, I wish I could do math. I just embarrassed myself for like 30 seconds. I was convinced this was wrong. And no, it's it's correct. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have to do these voiceovers with the calculator. Goodness. I'm sorry for all the chairs squeaking. I'm just I'm trying to get situated. Yeah, here it is. All right. As of March 2020, the Blackbird remains the fastest and highest flying production aircraft. Okay. You know what? There it is. It's all in the production quantifier. <laughs> production aircraft. Okay, production aircraft, that I can probably believe. Uh, if you strike out production, there's no freaking way the Blackbird is still the fastest and highest flyer. Uh, but still, you know, what do they consider production? You know, I don't know. The, uh, you know, the, the speed cars have speed records for cars have strict definitions of what production means. And I wonder if that same definition applies to airplanes. I, th I think they got to build like 20 of them or something because the, uh, what was it? The Bugatti Veyron super long tail or something. <laughs> I think is the current leader in production fastest car it cracked 300 miles an hour. And I think they have to build like 20 of them to, to do that or something. I don't know. Yeah, I thought the uh, Conan Seg would would uh, come in and smash that, but uh, I don't know. I haven't heard. I, I think that long tail set that record 
two, three years ago, and I haven't heard from Conan Sig, so um, I don't know. They might be scratching their heads trying to beat it. But I'm getting off topic. What do we got here? Entering service in 1966 under the code name Project Senior Crown. Perform flights over hot spots. North Vietnam, Cuba, Nicaragua. What the hell happened in Nicaragua? I have no idea. Libya and the Persian Gulf. 80,000 feet. It's incredible. Yeah. You can see the pilot there wearing the spacesuit. And here's the other part of that graph. 15, hold on, let me zoom in. What's the 15,000 miles say? 1971, an SR-71 flew 15,000 miles nonstop. Jeez. In 10 and a half hours, circumnavigating the continental U.S. twice. Wow. That's... So it flew around the continental United States twice in 10 and a half hours. <laughs> Without landing. I mean, I'm sure it's getting mid air fuel, but that's still freaking nuts. Yeah, averaging about 1,500 miles per hour and slowing down only to refuel in flight. There you go. See? I know things. And then on the right, we got the uh, altitude. I have no... What's that? 70K. All right, look, that looks like... So the plane at 70K looks like a U-2. Don't quote me on that. I pro I think that's probably a U-2. So this thing flew 10, 12, 15,000 feet higher than a U-2. And then, of course, at 30,000 feet, you got your commercial airliner. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they tell you. See, look at that. I, I know things. I just, just now saw the X-axis down below. <laughs> so U-2, yeah. Yeah, and then commercial liner, 737, and then a SPAD, whatever that is. But Good silhouette. See, I recognize that was U2 just on the silhouette. I'm learning things. I'm learning things. All right. I don't know what that is. Should I know what that is? <laughs> the engine grouping kind of looks like a, BT, or a B-51, but that is definitely not a B-51. So, moving on. Rockets. Yeah, they're all rockets. Thing. So I did not give the rocket section credit. At, at this point, there was like an hour before the museum closed. And uh, I was literally sprinting through. Well, all right, not literally. I was walking extremely fast. <laughs> I was not sprinting. But I was walking fast, looking quick, taking quick pictures, and not reading signs. Yeah, I, I got to go back. Yeah, I did snap a few pictures of rockets. I have no idea what kind of rocket this is. Sorry. Uh, okay, LGM Peacekeeper, maybe? Air Force's most powerful, accurate, and technologically advanced intercontinental ballistic missile. From 1986 to 2005. Oh, it's retired. Okay. Uh, Peacekeeper. Yeah, that's kind of ironic, but, you know, in our case, it actually is a Peacekeeper. <laughs> You go to your imperialistic countries, uh, Russia, China, definitely not a peacekeeper. All right. Um, you can read the rest of that if you would like. I'm going to keep moving. Well, this is cool. Yeah, so here's a Minuteman 1A MK5 reentry vehicle untested. So this thing, so, <laughs> so there's a lot of technology that goes into ICBM nukes, actually. Uh, not only the rocket. But the other part, or one of the other parts, is re-entry. So you shoot something up into space, it's got to come back into the atmosphere, and it's going, like, in space, what, Mach 20, Mach 25? As soon as it hits the atmosphere, it's getting hot, baby. <laughs> uh, so one of the guarded technologies, as far as I know, on these kinds of things are the re-entry vehicles, and a portion of that are the heat shields. And I think that's something that, you know, like North Korea probably doesn't have, at least in good quality. So they got some stupid rockets, but uh, if they want to put a nuke on one of those things, I'm not sure it's going to work. And here you go. We got a Miniman reentry vehicle tested. So you can see the difference between those. This one's burnt to hell. The other one look kind of bright and shiny. That's pretty cool, though. It's just crazy that uh, 
whatever material this thing's made out of survived. Reaching the target. Yeah, here we go. Minute Man, Minute Man 3 is a three-stage missile that can, retar that can reach targets more than 6,000 miles away. Does that reach around the Earth? That doesn't sound like it's that far, to be honest with you. <laughs> am, I, am I missing something? I thought Minute Man 3 was like a ICBM, you can hit anything. 6,000 miles doesn't sound that far away. Each stage burns out, drops away, next one ignites. Sophisticated guidance system. By slightly adjusting rocket nozzles. That's crazy. Who writes the code for that? Proper time, about three minutes after the launch. Small rockets slow the third stage. That's crazy. Yeah, so the thing about all these ICBMs, you can see the, at the bottom here, uh, sophisticated ICBMs and Russia, China have these two. Uh, they have a lot of decoys. So you, you can have one rocket and multiple warheads. And that's called uh, MIRVs. Multiple Independent Reentry Vehicles, I think is the acronym there. And so you can launch, I'm mostly making up these numbers, but you can launch one rocket and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my recording software and it's just looking bad. <laughs> I got so much data on this. Um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, you can launch one rocket and have like nine more heads that come out of that. And some of those might be decoys and the ones that are real, the decoys, they can maneuver once they hit the atmosphere. It's nuts. It's it's basically impossible to defend against, especially when you launch these things at high volume. And, uh, yeah, but we have it too, as you can read in the sign. <laughs> That's what MAD is all about, mutually assured destruction. Uh, okay. Emergency rocket communication system. Uh, what's this about? Make sure national leaders can send pre required attack orders. Um, all right, I'm not familiar with this, and I'm not going to read that, so feel free to pause. There's the aforementioned communication system. All right. Got another rocket. Uh, what is that? Let me zoom in for a second. What is this? Minuteman 3 second stage. Oh, okay, so this is Minuteman second stage. Wow. Inert. <laughs> Good to know that it is inert. You don't want to mix up the inert one with the live one when you're taking it to the museum. Uh, Minuteman 3 second rocket stage. Built by Aerojet. Uh, okay, you can read that. I'm not going to read it to you. More rockets. Yeah, satellite to the left. Yeah, so this was the more modern part of the hangar, or uh, more modern part of the museum. So the rockets were in the previous hangar. I kind of walked down a tunnel, got to this section of the museum, and this is kind of the modern wing, I guess you could say. I think it was probably the last one. Uh, so I, all that being said, I have no idea what this is. I have no idea what kind of satellite there is to the left. More the spacesuits. Maybe I zoomed in. Gemini B manned orbiting laboratory spacecraft. Ah, uh, I'm not going to read this to you. Gemini B looks similar to other Gemini vehicles. Only two crew in there. Okay. All right, moving on. And there's the Gemini B innards. Looks like a tight squeeze. Not much room for fun weightlessness in there, from what I see. And look at those tubes from the center from the uh, center console. I wonder what those are. There's like what one, two, three at least, not more. And they're only going to the passenger side. Uh, I don't know what those are. Wow, that's uh, this is an actual space reentry vehicle. You, it's burnt to hell. You see that? This is uh. Yeah, this is this is the re-entry vehicle with people inside. <laughs> it's crazy. What is this Apollo? Yeah, it's Apollo something. I can't quite. All right, maybe I got 
Apollo 15. There it is. <laughs> this is the actual Apollo 15 command module. That's crazy. That's crazy. Fourth successful moon landing mission. Only Apollo mission with an all U.S. Air Force crew. Interesting. All right. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to read these. I, I'm going to stop my recording right now. I, I feel like this file is just getting too big and Audacity is crying uncle. I'm, I'm going to stop this because I don't want to lose it. And I'll pick up with the next picture shortly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Once again, I apologize for the weird cut if there is one. I was just, <laughs> I've been talking for hours and I had the whole thing in the same audacity file and I could just look at it visually until it was struggling. So this is a brand new file. I hope we can get to the end on this one. We'll see back to the content. So this is a satellite. <laughs> it says USAF on the side. Other than that, I don't know what this is. <laughs> uh, 50, 50 on there being a sign next. I'll put the, uh, Everybody want to bet? Want to bet? Want to bet? Want to bet? Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it was coming. Oh, early warning satellite. That's what this is. Okay, so I guess this is an infrared satellite. Is that correct? Yes. Infrared sensors see heat from launches and exposures. Yeah. So the whole idea behind this satellite and its siblings, uh, these are positioned you know, all over the Earth, and they look for infrared heat signature of a launching rocket, which coincidentally is extremely hot so uh, the idea here is you know russia launches a nuke at us we will know it's happening as quickly as possible um, you know that's the idea discover what is happening give me that intelligence as quickly as possible what else we got oh this is the x24 okay so this thing is this all right, back up. I'm looking at the things in the front. That thing in the back, <laughs> I wish, I didn't know the significance of that thing. That that thing is incredible. So that turns out that's a Valkyrie something, something, something. So that's another Mach 3 airplane. A uh, bomber, actually. I think it was a bomber. Um, yeah, a thing in the back that says U.S. Air Force on it. That is a Valkyrie bomber. I think it's a bomber. Uh, yeah, it's got like six jet engines. And they built this thing. This this uh, predates the SR-71 as far as I know. And it's got like six, seven, eight. And I think it's six. It is a total beast. That thing is a beast. And uh, I forget the reason for canceling it. It was... Maybe it wasn't a bomber? Oh, gosh. See, this is the problem with waiting too long. I should have knocked these pictures out, you know last month when they were fresh in my mind and now I'm you know racking my brain trying to remember but when I was walking through I didn't even like really recognize what that was uh oh hold on nope nope alright that one's good sorry I hit the button on my mic on the back of my mic and it like changes the field of gain I'll call it I just see in the front, you know, like you can change it to like pick up sound all around or have it targeted towards the front or to have it targeted the front and the back. You know, it's just me. So I just need in the front. Anyway, that Valkyrie. Uh, yeah, I just wish I could remember everything about it. <laughs> I don't even have this. This might be the best picture I have of it because at the time I did not even know the significance of what I was looking at. Um, yeah, it wasn't until later. I think I left and my brother was like, Hey man, could they have a Valkyrie there? I'm like, I don't know, Valkyrie. What are you talking about? Google, you know, doo -doo -doo. I was like, Oh yeah, I remember seeing that thing. And yeah, they only built like two of them and it went like Mach three plus in 1950 or something, which was nuts. You know, it just had so much horsepower at the back. But anyway, so what's in the front here? I don't even know. Lifting body. So this thing on the right, is that... So there was something from Boeing here that I saw that I didn't even know existed, so to speak. So I like 
you walk around Boeing and there's pictures of all these things they built and there's one aircraft there. I didn't even know what it was. You know, I didn't give it too much of attention until I saw the thing here. Um, okay. Well, uh, I got back into rockets. <laughs> Keep going. This is the X-40A. And that is all I can tell you about that one. Let me zoom in a little bit on the caption. And it's still too small to read. And I'm not going to read it to you anyway. So next. There's a blurry picture of a jet engine. <laughs> rocket engine, sorry. Blurry picture of a rocket engine. Next. There's a somewhat less blurry picture of a pair of rocket engines. <laughs> Those look like PDs to me. PD, you know what that means? It's a package deal. <laughs> I don't think you get one without the other. That's a package deal. And presumably made by Pratt and Whitney. No clue what that is. Like, not even a little bit. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Boom. All right, this thing. This is this was one of the things I really wanted to see when I was here. Uh, so this is the YF-23. And you're asking yourself, what the is a YF-23? So this was the F-22 competitor. So this was the Northrop submission for the advanced 5th gen fighter contract. Um, so this one had to, had, to fly, they had to fly off between this and the F-22. Obviously, spoiler alert, the F-22 one. Uh, but this thing was pretty freaking special. And I, there, there's a story on the war zone about the pilot, the stunt pilot, stunt pilot, the test pilot who flew both of these things. I think there was only one guy in the entire world who flew both planes. And he wrote a, well, wrote, he, he got in touch with the war zone or it was an interview or whatever it was uh, on why the F-22 won and because this thing, I think, I'm trying to remember. I think this thing had better maneuverability. Uh, if you look at its wings, you can't see its wings right now, but they're uh, they're like they're trapezoids. Is that the right? Yeah, they're they're trapezoids. Um, they're not like kind of swept back. It's not a traditional wing shape. Uh, I might have a picture that's a little better, but there's nowhere to take a picture, you know, straight from the top. So if you Google, just Google YF-23, and you'll see what I'm talking about with the wings. And those verticals, look at those verticals, man. That's, those are sexy. <laughs> this was a good, and those intakes, well, I like those intakes. This is a good looking aircraft. Uh, the exhaust is pretty hot too. The exhaust was all on the top, kind of like the B-2. So if you look at the B-2, it, its exhaust is all on the top. This was the same way. Um, I'm pretty sure it had absolutely nothing in terms of thrust vectoring. I think there was, there was something I'm really racking my brain here. I think maybe it's internal weapons bay was not as big or something. That could be totally wrong. Please don't quote me on that. I, that could be totally wrong. I, I would have to Google now the differences between the YF-23 and the F-22, but there you go. Th this is probably one of maybe two aircraft built. It might be one of one. I, I honestly don't know. So the fact that it's here and I'm staring at it in the flesh is incredible. And this thing. All right. This. <laughs> how much time we got? I could talk two hours just on this thing. So th I was. My jaw hit the floor when I saw this thing. Because I've read about this thing online. There's pictures of this thing up at Boeing all over the place. And I was like. And I was walking here, boom, and here it was. You know, this is one of two, I think. Uh, oh, and the X-36 in the background. That's that's the thing I was talking about. I saw a picture of that thing. I see pictures of that thing hanging up at Boeing, and I didn't even know it was, like, real or resisted. But back to the front and center. So this is an X-45, I think. Um, yeah, so th this was like, <laughs> like I said, how much time we got? I, uh I don't even know if I should go into the whole thing. But we were, Boeing at least, and I'm sure the other defense contractors, were doing autonomous drones like 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if not further. Like publicly, 20 years ago. I, I, that's a caveat. Tw publicly, 20 years ago at this point. Pretty damn close. Maybe like 
18, 19. But this thing, this was uh, called an X-45. Folks, drone swarms are the future. They are the future of aerial combat, whether you want to believe it or not. Autonomous drone swarms. Whoever, whoever from this point on can build the best autonomous drone swarm is going to win. The fact that we're still putting butts and seats on aircraft blows my mind. It, I'm sure there's reasons for it. Most of them are over my head. Uh, most of them are probably politics. <laughs> uh, but th- this thing was a pioneer on Tom Stone Swarms. Absolute pioneer. Unless the caveat to that is, unless it was happening in the black world way before this. And it could have. It could have. But given the investment made in the F-35, I kind of doubt it because. <laughs> but there's some other politics there probably too. The fact is this thing probably wipes the floor with an F-35. But, you know, when you got F-35s being built in 40 states, there ain't no congressperson going to kill that program. So <laughs> when it's bringing that kind of jobs to his constituent base. This thing, though, this thing was incredible. This and its companion. So <laughs> they'd have this thing really, really flying. And, and you think about a drone. So the first thing you think about a drone is probably the Predator drone because that was like the first one that hit mainstream. Flying, uh, you know, missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. But that thing is under the complete control of a human being. There's a man in the loop for 100% of its flight. There was somebody literally in a cockpit all the way in the round, uh, on the other side of the world with a joystick flying that thing. This thing, on the other hand, very much more autonomous than that. You have somebody at a desktop computer issuing very high-level generalized commands like fly over here, destroy this thing. You know, It's a point-and-click application on a desktop. You don't have a flight cockpit. You don't have a joystick. You don't even know how to fly. Uh, the hive mind in this thing figures all that out for you and it's great so you you can issue a command like uh go destroy this target and it's not even set in stone which if you have a swarm you know i say swarm there was two of these things flying at the time and i think two more in simulation so like four flying you know you click over you click on this thing and say destroy this and as the operator, you, you're not even sure which aircraft in the swarm is going to execute that mission. So they get that command. They start talking back to each other like, okay, who has the weapons? Who has most fuel? Who's closest maybe? You know, who, who can uh, maybe who has the best chance of survival based on, I don't know, if you have different drones, maybe this one's more stealthy than that one. And they factor all these things in in the blink of an eye. So much faster than a human operator could. And once they make a decision... The drone that wins goes off, prosecutes that target, finds, fixes, and kills it. And, uh, th- I mean, that, that's the kind of technology we were dealing with here. And it was so promising. And the Air Force was, yeah! And the Navy was, yeah! And then the Air Force was, ah, nope, we're out. <laughs> so w- when both of them were on it, it was J-U-CAS. It was joint. The J was joint. Uh, U-CAS was... UCAS. I can't <laughs> but at some point the J dropped so it was the Air Force and the Navy joint and then I think the Air Force dropped first yes the Air Force dropped first and then like Northrop jumped in and when you're doing anything naval operating on a carrier it's got to be bulkier it's got to withstand you know and so like Northrop swooped in with this like bulkier X-45 I think they called theirs the X-47 and Boeing totally got screwed in the whole operation once the Air Force dropped out because their their flight was like Air Force, you know, specify, you know, designed specifically for the Air Force, which is less beefy landing gear, uh, or some other things like maybe bigger fuel tank, uh, smaller. I think no, 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 I think it was smaller overall. Don't quote me on the fuel tank; that could be wrong. But but uh, basically, Boeing's submission was not naval ready and they ended up losing and so yeah if you google x47 you'll see pictures of it 
uh, I think it was the first autonomous vehicle to be mid air refueled, something like that. It landed on an aircraft carrier. Uh, there's a whole story there about Northrop stealing Boeing software. Not stealing, but Boeing being forced to give their software to Northrop. I mean, there was some crazy stuff there. I'm not going to recount the whole thing now. Uh, Wired Magazine wrote a really good article on this. Um, if you Google like, I can put a link in the description too, but if you Google like Wired Magazine, I don't know, Boeing versus Northrop drones or something, it'll probably pop up. Uh, yeah, it's a whole freaking crazy story. It really is. Anyway, so I was super happy to see the JU cast. One of them. So this is one of two. The other one is somewhere else. This is the red one. <laughs> so there's like red and a blue one. And I'm saying that. Look at the wingtips and the nose. You can see the red on the left wingtip and the nose. And I think the other one had like a blue wingtip and blue nose. And as far as I know, they were the same, but. Anyway, th this thing should have started early. Yeah, I never finished the story. Uh, but basically, then the Navy dropped. So <laughs> you, you had the biggest technological leap in uh, aviation warfare since onset of the jet engine, since the onset of stealth aircraft, waiting at the door. Because at the time, 20 years ago especially, this thing, I mean, China wasn't even sniffing drones Russia wasn't even sniffing drones at the time. It's, you know, probably not. And if, if we had pursued this and laid, put, all, put a lot of our eggs in this basket, they wouldn't have to be stealthy. I mean, can you imagine a drone swarm on a, uh, you know, air defense system? Like 20, 50, 100, 500. It doesn't have to be stealthy. It's just going to be totally overwhelming. Look at Ukraine. Like, Russia is doing this right now in Ukraine with stupid Iranian drones. R Russia was freaking dead in the water. They were out of missiles. They're out. <laughs> they were just out. They were out. And then freaking Iran comes in. Here's here's your drone. I mean, they give them these drones. They're basically slow flying cruise missiles. And then they're about to get some short range ballistic missiles too. Uh, all right. I don't want to get into that right now. Moving on. X forty five A. Here's the wingtip. Yeah, I mean you can see the crank kite design. This thing was obviously very stealthy. This was a demo, so this is probably a little smaller than you probably have in for real, you know, production aircraft. But you know, maybe not. These things had two small weapons bays. I think they could fit two two bombs. I don't know how big. Probably not two thousand pounders. Maybe thousand five hundred pound. I don't know. But I, I got real excited when I saw this thing because I've read about this thing a lot in the past and it was just like, there it was. I was pretty pretty pumped to see this thing. Here's another view, more of it from the back. You can see it's got that crank kite design. The exhaust is covered up. <laughs> oh. And if you look in the distance, you can see the Valkyrie X-58 which also blew my mind. I had no idea they were done flying that thing. I was reading about that not that long ago. All right, there's the, here's another awesome picture. So that's the YF-23 in the foreground. And various ceiling things. That's the Valkyrie. So you see the Valkyrie sells big intakes. That's the Valkyrie. Kind of the top left of the YF-23. I wish you could see my mouse pointer right now. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm pretty sure that's the Valkyrie. Yeah, it's a Valkyrie. And let's see that blue stuff to the left. That's actually a Boeing installed fun zone or something. I didn't go in there. I didn't have time. I, I took a quick glance, you know, from the peasant side of the fence. And I uh, didn't see much in there that I was too pumped about. And given the fact that I had five minutes to see the rest of the museum, I gave it a pass. Teal Ruby experimental warning sensor. All right, some satellite early warning. Teal Ruby from the 70s. Pause and read. I presume that's Teal Ruby. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I had like 10 minutes left. And uh, they had this whole thing for the space shuttle, like a big ramp and like form line here. I'm like, oh, this is going to be cool. And there was no line because I was so late and it was like, you know, Tuesday or something. Uh, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, no, Friday, Thursday, whatever, Thursday, I think it was Thursday. 
Uh, I went in the space shuttle thing. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was cool, but like, uh, I wish I would have spent more time, you know, looking at Life 23. Uh, but I guess this is some early warning satellite. Yes, I presume. No, no presumption necessary. This is the space shuttle cockpit. Which, uh, for being built in the 70s, I think it was, this is pretty glassy looking, you know? I mean, like a center console glass, uh, top left glass, top right glass, top or uh, bottom right and left glass, I think. The space shuttle was fly by wire, I know that. I think it was one of the first aircraft to be fly by wire. Uh, it's kind of roomy, too. I mean, look at all that. Look at that headroom, man. You could. Man, I could I could probably fit in that chair. And here's another picture of it. You can see all yeah. Look at all those ceiling switches. Like how, I mean, how long does it take to learn what all those things do? It's crazy. I just imagine Steve Jobs sitting in one of these things, like an airplane cockpit, because he was all about you know like user experience and just being smooth and efficient. And <laughs> I bet he'd sit in these things and probably vomit. Uh, anyway, uh, what do we got here? Air Force. I have no idea what any of those jets are, so I'm going to move on. Boom. All right, here's a YF-23 nose on. That's a pretty sleek profile. It's like a butter knife coming at you. <laughs> I know I've said that five times already, but look at that. Look at that profile. That's pretty sexy. That is a sexy profile. All right. There it is. YF-23, Black Widow 2. All right, so here's a picture of it. So you can see the trapezoid wings. Look at that. It's pretty wild looking, isn't it? You can see the exhaust is all on the uh, top. Uh, yeah. Competed in the late 80s, early 90s against the YF-22. Okay, that's what they called the F-22 before the, I guess they dropped the Y. Uh, yeah, new generation Soviet fighters and SAMs. They want a stealthy fifth gen aircraft. And this sucker, this beat the F-22 in some categories, but I guess overall not enough to win the whole competition. Oh, but man, that's a, that's a sexy aircraft in my opinion. I just, hmm, that's good looking. Here it is again. I just I love those verticals that are so slanted. It's like it's almost like why'd you even put them on? <laughs> oh, I know why they put them on. Like I said with the B two, you don't have any verticals. Your airplane is extremely unstable, extremely unstable. Uh, and I guess they figured I'm surprised they could get away honestly with that sharp of an angle on them. Um, you yeah, look at the F twenty two, and they're way more vertical than these are so I, I you know what i bet the trapezoidal wings helped with that i bet the trapezoidal wings probably provided some stability enough st stability where they could take these verticals and flatten them out and that probably helped with stealth for sure i mean that whole thing i just feel like look at that it just looks very skinny to me from this angle look at that i, I feel like it's you know, two feet tall, maybe like, <laughs> I mean, you take away the wheels and like, what's left? There's just not a whole lot there. Very, very slim profile. I like it. And there's a YF-23 engine undoubtedly. And, uh, moving on. There's the business end in the back. All right, folks, I'm back. Sorry for the weird cut, if there is one. Uh, yeah, when I left off, we were looking at the YF-23 business end. That is sexy. It's just so sleek. No thrust vectoring there, I don't think. <laughs> Maybe that's one reason why the F-22 won. Oh, man, it is late, I'm, but I, I, I'm going to push... Oh, I'm going to push through these pictures. I just want to... We'll be done with this. This has been carrying on for what four or five weeks. It's time to be done. I put a bow on this. But look at that. That is, uh, man, that is sleek. That is sleek. I mean, top to bottom, there is like 
three feet, maybe. Yeah, it's just whew. those verticals cannon off to the side. And that's just you can see the space shuttle tail there too. Uh, but man, that is that is a sleek business end. There's one engine. Is there a vector in there? I don't know what that little V-shaped thing on the top is. Maybe that could do some kind of deflecting, but I don't think so. Not like not like the F-22. Half blue. <laughs> so I got a history of this thing. This is this is kind of funny to me anyway. Uh, so when I was growing up, yeah, I, I read that Skunk Works book. And I, I remember in there that the radar cross-section for the vehicle that would eventually become the F-117 was called Have Blue. <laughs> so I was on AOL Instant Messenger, you know, back in like, I don't know, ninth grade. And I think I tried making my username Have Blue or something. And it was already taken. <laughs> so... I added that name to my buddy's list or whatever it was. And he'd get online. i get, uh, you know, he'd tell me when he came in line. I sent him a message once like, do you even know what Have Blue is? <laughs> he was like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for all I know, this is probably like the lead engineer on this thing, you know. Um, so that was, that was kind of funny I guess yeah I, I tried naming myself have blue and when I learned somebody else also knew that name you know like it was unique to me I was taken aback like who is this who is this mother and then it kind of hit me I was like wow maybe this guy uh is way more deserving of this name than I am <laughs> uh yeah let's I didn't even read this yet um yeah, I think this is basically a model of proof of concept for stealth. That particular shape, anyway, or what would become close to that shape. Um, yeah, it's it's late. We're running out of time, so pause and read. And there it is. This is actually a bad picture of it because of all the clutter in the background. You got another Boeing jet hanging from the ceiling on the left there. Wait, is that Boeing? I don't know, actually. I take it back. I don't know if that's Boeing. I've definitely seen a thing somewhere before, though. And I'm not even sure it's in the foreground, but or the background. But yeah, foreground here, if you can piece it out, is the half blue model, which the the one that looks like the F-117. <laughs> Except for the tail. The tails are different. They're the verticals. That's funny. I saw this thing. I was like, wow. I, I guess that's the actual model. Um, did you read the sign? I didn't read the sign. <laughs> I assume this is the actual model, the have blue model, which, like I said, takes me back to like 8th to ninth grade. And there's the uh, X-45 again. Uh, I just, ah, so upset. Look at that thing. That, that thing is just beautiful. It is beautiful. And the Air Force was like, nope. And then the Navy was like, nope. But, uh, a little silver lining, I guess. Boeing did win the MQ-25. So, yeah, this thing, this was a precursor to the MQ-25. That's absolutely 100% correct. Um, yeah, when they built this thing, they had no idea the Navy was even going to be a customer. But, yeah, they built this thing for the Air Force. Then the Navy joined. Then the Air Force dropped out. And then the Navy dropped out. Then, then the Navy said, oh, wait, hold on, just kidding. We still want a carrier operable, operable, carrier oper, operable drone uh, to refuel our F-18s. <laughs> I'm not saying the MQ-25 is based on this design, but I'm saying the program lineage is very tightly coupled. And whew, look at that. Look at that front profile. That, that's that is sexy. That is sexy. It's got the uh, intake on the top, so it's like, you know, I think, you know, I have no idea how stealthy the intake on this thing is. I, I do know that stealthy aircraft have S ducts that essentially hide the jet engine blades from radar, and 
that is very much one of the big and proprietary things that go into stealth aircraft. Uh, that being said, I have no idea if this thing has an S duct. Uh, probably not because it was just a demonstration aircraft and they probably did not want to spend that kind of time and money on demonstration. I mean, obviously if this is going to be fielded, they probably want something like that and would redesign that part of it or plug in an already existing design. But, you know, I say that, but that's the beauty of autonomous drone swarms because they don't have to be super stealthy because you're not keeping a person alive. I mean, this thing, look at that shape. That's pretty freaking stealthy. Uh, that's not going to re reflect much back. I, I can't speak for the intake. All I see is black. I don't know what's on the other side of that black, if it's an S duct or not. But I bet, you know, the intake being on the top is a stealthy feature in itself, I guess, because you're going to have to have a plane or something you know, an emitter high up in the sky to catch that. Because at the bottom, you're not going to see that. Um, but if you just throw a drone swarm at somebody, you could use biplanes shape from, you know, 1920. It doesn't matter. If you, if you throw enough of them at the target, they're going to overwhelm it. And you can do that. You can make them cheap. You can make them fast. You can make them not needing to be able to withstand 20,000 air hours on the airframe. There's just so many advantages to drone swarms. Um, yeah, looking at this thing, I mean, that's clearly stealthy. and That's hot and nice, but maybe it doesn't even need to be stealthy. Not if you got enough of them. All right, moving on. Oh, here it is. Boeing X-45, yeah, J-U-Cast, there it is. I was talking about the J-U-Cast earlier. Uh, yeah, that's a cool picture. So you can see the weapon bay. So that's one weapon bay open in the picture there. There's another one on the other side. So even these small little demo models could drop two weapons each. Yeah, first flight in May of 20... The first flight on this thing was twenty over 20 years ago. I mean, where are we right now in drone warfare? I, not that far along, folks. That's very depressing to me. It's a detriment to national security that we have not totally embraced autonomous drones as the future of air combat. Because guess what? Whether we like it or not, that's the future. Um, that's definitely where China's going. That's where what's left of Russia is going. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, one of the biggest, you know, what's the word? I don't know, things that people don't like about it are the ethics. You know, we got to have, you know, we don't want machines killing people without people in the know. Well, first of all, you definitely can insert a person in the loop. Uh, but the other thing of that is China ain't going to care about that. Russia ain't going to care about that. Um, if we're going to sit around sitting on ethics while they leapfrog us in technology... Uh, all right, trying to stay positive. Hey, it's a good day, right? It's a good day. It's a good day. Remember that. It's a good day. Maybe it's a bad day for you. I'm sorry if it is. But you know what? Better days are coming. Your next good day is going to be my bad day. So it all evens out. It all evens out. What does the sign say? I've been talking so much about nonsense. Yeah, September 2000. Jeez, that was my freshman year in high school. Yeah. Probably shouldn't say that. Now anybody who finds my birthday online is going to know how old I am. <laughs> the first of two X-45s A using research from this bird of prey aircraft. Yeah, there's a bird of prey hanging from the ceiling. I think that was in the previous segment. Made its first flight. So they built this thing from nothing to something to first flight in two years. Second vehicle follow. Yeah, X forty five A hit a ground target with an inert precision guided weapon, and that's uh, uh, never mind. Thomas who flew pre pan seed mission. Seed is suppression of enemy air defenses. So yeah, you can load these things up with weapons. You can load them up with jammers. You can load them up with. You know, ISR equipment, you know, 
radars soak up antennas to soak up enemy intelligence. It, you, you put an autonomous drone swarm out there, and they don't all have the same thing. That's the other beauty of the hive mind, you know. Right now, you, you put a tactical fighter out there, it's got to have everything. It's got to be a jack of all trades. It's got to have its weapons. It's got to be stealthy. It's got to have its communications, you know, sat link, whatever. You know, it's got to have, you know, EA measures, you know, jammers. Um, you know, you take a Thomas drone swarm, and you can have one drone specialized in one thing. So this one might be the weapons truck. You know, this one might be the communication hub. You know, this th this is the one that has a satellite radio. So everybody wants to talk. They can talk to this one, and it goes to the satellite and goes out. Uh, you know, this one has the EA countermeasures. So this one has the jammers. And, and uh, you know, right now, and, that, and that's all cheaper and modular. And uh, it's just right now, you, you, you know, you look at your F-35, and it's got all those things combined. So it's freaking super expensive. Not to mention the, uh, you know, the whole parts of the aircraft that got to keep the pilot alive, the um, environment with the, you know, the oxygen, the temperature, uh, life support system. That's what I'm looking for. And drones don't care about that. You can pull 20 Gs in a drone without blinking. <laughs> you pull 20 Gs in a fighter aircraft, the person in it, they're blacking out, dead. Yeah. All right, hopefully in all that rambling, you had enough time to read the sign. I'm feeling my blood pressure rise, and it's time to move on. And this thing, this, so this thing, this is cool. I did, this, this might be the newest thing in the museum. I had no idea they were done with this thing, much less shifted off to a museum. This is a Valkyrie X-58, I believe. What does it say on the side? Uh, X, XQ-58A. Okay, I was close. XQ-58A. They're still, uh, they're still testing with these things, man. Like I read Warzone stories about this thing. I'm sure it's like you know model two, three, four. This is like this is probably model one. But look at that thing, man. That thing is pretty freaking slick. That is a sexy profile from this angle. And uh, China's already put out their clone for this thing, so you know, go China. Here we go. Kratos XQ58A Valkyrie unmi unmanned. <laughs> what did I say? Unmined? The XQ58A Valkyrie is the first example of a new class of high performance unmanned aircraft that can be rapidly fielded in large numbers. There's the drone swarm. And provide support to manned aircraft. Yeah, they're all about the wingmen. I, I still, still feel like the Air Force is. Very reluctant. Uh, I I shouldn't say that. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I do not know. Um, loyal wingman is a big thing right now. You know, Australia built a loyal. Australia Boeing built a loyal wingman. Jeez, I don't know. Coming up on two three years now. China also cloned it recently. <laughs> I bet they're just sitting back and just freaking laughing. I bet they're just in every single one of our networks. Uh, I... All right, anyway, you've had enough time to read that. Moving on. Yeah, low cost. The whole idea behind this thing is supposed to be low cost. And it's still pretty freaking stealthy, so that's kind of cool. There's another view of it. The little uh, left quarter front. Also got intake on the front, on the uh, top. You see that? I just, man, I, me not knowing anything, I don't know why you'd ever build another plane without the intake on the top. I feel like that's just such a better place to put it. Uh, there's got to be... Hmm, I, I wonder what the trade-offs on that are. Yeah, all right. Moving on. And here's a bunch of stuff hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> that first helicopter looks like something you might get at Radio Shack. That is pretty tiny, you know, before Radio Shack went belly up. Oh, yeah, I took a picture of this thing. I have no idea what this is. I don't think I've ever seen that in my entire life. Kind of ugly. I, I'm not a fan, you know, blended wing. 
that's good for for that. That's, this thing just looks kind of ugly to me. Moving on. Whatever the hell that thing. Yeah, this is like the first V twenty two, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, take take a look at its wingtips. You see those uh, propellers, and certainly looks like there's a joint there that lets it rotate forward. So whatever the hell this thing is, is trying to be a V twenty two Osprey. This thing, tacit blue. Yes, this is a Northrop demonstration aircraft. So I've seen pictures of this thing and thought it was fake because it doesn't even look like an airplane. <laughs> I looked at a picture of that thing and was like, that thing flies? Okay. And then here it is in the flesh. <laughs> Very flattened out. I can't even begin to offer an explanation on why they put all this flattened out material up front. Like, why wouldn't you just take some scissors and cut that off? You know, <laughs> let me just, you know, hold on, hold on, Jack Northrop. Let me just, uh, let me, let me grab your scissors and I'm just going to trim some, trim some parts off this aircraft real quick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They really want to give that sucker a square front, but sure it has its reasons, either aerodynamically or stealthy or all of the above. That thing's kind of ugly though. I'm not I've never been a big fan of this thing. I've I've seen pictures of it and I'm just like, eh. And I saw it live and I'm looking at it now. The slanted verticals are sexy, but it's just very boxy. I feel like this is the uh I don't know, Volkswagen bus of aircraft. It's just, I mean, yeah, it's got that. And then, and then I feel like they're trying to play it off by putting that very flattened, sharp, in quotes, edge on the front, you know. You're not cutting your hand on the fuselage of that thing, I don't think. And they just stretched it out and made it flat. It's like they put a, geez, I don't know, hula hoop on a, VW bus. <laughs> yeah, all right. What's, yeah, look at that picture of that thing. Like, why wouldn't they just just trim that shit off? I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> all right. Built in the early 1980s in great secrecy. Tacit blue. Tested advanced radar sensors and new ideas and stuff. Uh, new ideas, I'll say. <laughs> they put some new ideas in that thing. Uh, approved stealthy aircraft. You have curved surfaces. Okay. Yeah, it's greatly influenced B2. Yeah, so so backing up a little bit here. So, yeah, the F-117 Nighthawk, that was the first stealthy aircraft ever produced. And there's, I guess, I saw one. I saw one. I think I've already talked about it. I definitely have because it was in a previous hangar. And if you notice anything about that, it's got a bunch of flat surfaces. And the prevailing thought, or the prevailing takeaway from that is, hey, you need flat stuff to be stealthy. I mean, I thought that for a while, but, but the answer to that is no, you don't. Uh, the reason they made it faceted like that is because, at least this is what I heard or read somewhere, um, that's all their computers could model at the time. So, you know, you're talking about computing power from, I don't know, late 70s, early 80s. And the, the math behind the curved surfaces and things was just it, too much, took too much. So they designed and built this thing with flat, faceted surfaces because that's what the computers could wrap their heads around, <laughs> so to speak. And, uh, yeah, I remember from the Skunk Works book, they built this thing, and it was just so unstable, of course. I mean, it was an aerodynamicist nightmare. Um, but, man, it killed the radar cross-section test. <laughs> and there is a quote, I think, from a, North or, or a, from a Lockheed guy. Um, somebody told him something along the lines of, this faceted piece of you know, POS, it's never going to fly. We can't make... And he was like, we'll teach it to fly. <laughs> because it was at the time, it was such a breakthrough in, you know, stealth technology. And, and then, you know, the B-2 comes along, which is, I think, you know, as far as I know publicly anyway, was the, the next stealthy aircraft. And the B-2, you know, look at my pictures, has got curved surfaces all over the place. 
And the reason that has curved surfaces is because the computers had come along enough to be able, I guess, to model a curved surface, you know, compared to radar cross-section, whatever, whatever goes into that. Um, but yeah, the F-117, that wasn't the case, so I'm sorry. I got sidetracked in my own mind. They said this was a, a uh, yeah, a test vehicle to test, like, curved surface stealth, so. All right. Low aspect radar signature test of blue demonstrated such an aircraft could loiter over and behind the battlefield. Oof, man. That's hard. That thing looks so boxy to me. I just, it's hard to believe to some extent that thing is stealthy. All right, what do we got here? Another SR 71? Yeah, they had like two SR 71s there. Um, this is actually not a traditional SR. This is precursor to the SR 71, I think, even though it looks very similar. Like Y twelve or something? I can't I can't quite remember. Moving on. YF twelve. There we go. Man. Check me out. <laughs> I got most of the letters and characters, right? Yeah, developed in the nineteen sixties, Mach three interceptor to to defend against supersonic bombers. Based on the A-12 reconnaissance, YF-12 became the forerunner of the highly sophisticated... Yeah, so this thing came first, I guess. Yeah, 1963. This was before the SR-71. I mean, is there much of a difference there, Eddie? It looks <laughs> it looks pretty, pretty similar to me. All right, you guys can read that at your leisure. Here we go. All right, here's the Valkyrie. Those are Valkyrie intakes. <laughs> The, not to be confused with the X-58A Valkyrie. <laughs> this thing had the Valkyrie name long before that in the 60s. I'm pretty sure this thing's from the 60s. Yeah, this was a Mach 3 bomber, I think. I'd have to Google to be sure. Yeah, it was it was somewhere around that fast. Then they canceled it. Yeah, here we go. XB-70 Valkyrie. Yeah, Futuristic was originally conceived in the 1950s. Jeez. High altitude nuclear strike bomber that could fly at Mach 3. Wow. Mach 3 nuclear bomber in the 50s? Are you kidding me? By the early 1960s, however, new SAMs threatened the survivability. I, you know, what? See, all right. That. How can that be? In the early 60s, SAMs threatened the survivability. Then. If this thing flew Mach 3 and wasn't safe, then why was the SR-71 safe flying at essentially the same speed? Maybe a little faster. Maybe the SR-71 was, was a lot higher. Maybe more an altitude versus speed thing. Less costly nuclear-armed ICBM. See, you tell me an ICBM is less costly than this thing? Uh, yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> My personal opinion, we should get rid of the ICBM leg of the nuclear triad. I I just don't think it's worth it. We could take that money and buy more bombers and do more nuclear ballistic submarines. I, I mean, the ICBMs, I just... First, out of all the options, those are... Well, not if you take off from the airplane. I mean, ICBMs are take a while. But, I mean, if you're launching a B-2 from the United States, you know, it's going to take, you know, 20 hours to get to the other side of the world. Um, yeah, I think the nuclear subs are by far the most lethal prong of the triad because they could be anywhere in the world. Nobody knows where they're at. Um, and they're going to be fastest to target because they're probably in an ocean close to our adversaries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you launch an ICBM or you launch a B-2. Uh, yeah, it's just not going to be as fast. I, I, I and The ICBMs are just, everybody knows where they are. I, I think we should decommission and use that billions of dollars to shore up. Well, we got the B-21 coming out and uh, nuclear subs. I don't know. My opinion, my opinion. Nobody asked me, though, so I'm pretty sure we're going to stick to the plan. No clue what we're looking at here. None whatsoever. I don't know what that is on the right or the left or in the background. Moving on. 
this thing. Uh, yeah, I've seen this in pictures. No clue what it is, what it did. Looks like a NASA research aircraft, maybe. Maybe somebody wanted to try out something with the forward swept wings. And here's a closer picture of it. It is pretty cool looking. I have no idea what advantage that gives you. None. But I'm guessing since you don't see very many airplanes that have that, it's probably dubious at best. Marginal at best. There it is. <laughs> and they got a flying saucer. I presume that's maybe the ship from Independence Day. It looks a little different, but maybe uh, maybe that's the sidecar or something. I don't know. And we got vertical hang from the ceiling row. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Don't know what I'm looking at, but it's a pretty cool perspective. I just couldn't get enough YF-23. <laughs> Alright, this is actually a better view of the Hab Blue model. So you can see the... Uh, it looks... So this, so this has all the faceted flat, flat edges. And again, that from what I understand, that's because the computers back in the 70s, early 80s, this is all they could computationally deal with were flat areas. You threw in the curves and it was just, eh, eh, can't do it. I will say the tail, the verticals on this thing are different than the real ship. Um, quite a bit different, I believe. I'd have to go back and look at my own pictures, but uh, yeah, they slanted inward and that's that's what they did in the SR-71 so interesting interesting but you know the YF-23 laid them down almost all the way on the wings so I don't I wonder if the direction of the angle matters or if it's just the angle I yeah I don't know if the direction angle makes you stealthy or just having it at an angle makes you stealthy there's some more XQ-58 Valkyrie so this is the other Valkyrie <laughs> again <laughs> <laughs> Not to be confused with the 1950s Mach 3 bomber that we've already looked at. No clue what that thing is. Uh, at this point, I was like sprinting around the museum, just taking as many pictures as, as I could. Uh -uh. Oh, satellite catcher. That, that's crazy. So, all right. I, I'm going to sum this up based on what I know. So, back in the day, uh, you know, we had satellites that would take pictures of things. This is long before digital photos, though. So they took pictures on actual film, and the only way to get that film was to drop it back to space. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we had these orbiting satellites. I guess they probably came launched, or they launched with X amount, X number of, uh, oh, film canisters. There we go. Took their pictures, and then it was time to drop that sucker in the air. The uh, satellite's not going to land, so they just dropped that thing. Is that correct? Recovered gear load from the rear door. Yeah, that sounds correct. Satellite catching became important in regular Air Force operation. Yeah. So, long story short, these things caught film canisters, dropped from satellites before digital photos were a thing. And there's that thing again. Like I said, I've seen that sucker's picture on the wall before and don't know anything about it. And there's the infamous, beautiful, autonomous JUKS in the background. Yeah. Man, look at that thing. Yeah, it's sleek. X36. Oh, here we go. I'm going to read this, actually, because I don't know what this thing is. Mid-1990s, NASA, Boeing, then McDonnell Douglas, Phantom Works, Tailless. Man, they were building Tailless stuff in the mid-90s. Wow. Developed technology for renewable Tailless fighter. Yeah. It's not easy, man, from what I understand. I think any aerodynamicist will tell you that design is extremely unstable in the air. Got a quarter of production. No, two were, so two were built. So this is the only one that actually flew. Wow. So the picture that I've seen is of this thing in the air. So it's the exact same one that I saw. <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. May 1997. Man, they were doing tailless fighters back in May 1997. It's crazy. Met or exceeded all of its goals. And I guess the Air Force just dropped it on the floor because 
Do you see a tailless fighter in the inventory? I don't. Ugh. All right. Uh, it's getting the weird stuff at the end. Ah, I just I couldn't put down couldn't put down the UCAS. <laughs> ah, thing is sexy. All right, moving on. Oh, not moving on. <laughs> <laughs> There's the exhaust profile. That, that's pretty sleek. It's pretty sleek. Uh, no clue what that is, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Oh, I thought that was cool. I I started up this thing and I was like, how did they fluff out this parachute without putting air into it? You know. <laughs> like, how did they hang that? There's got to be like 100 mount points to keep that thing looking like it's just a parachute deployed into the wind and it's got the you know half circle dome and the whole thing. But it it just looked like that. I I thought that I was impressed. I was impressed. I don't know how they looking at this right now. I don't know how they just like keep this thing open. Is that a fan? Oh oh oh! I just zoomed in. Is that a fan? No 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 no! I take it back. I take it back. No, that thing's got to have like a hundred connect points to the ceiling. I don't, I don't know how they keep it all spread out. Yeah, there was a whole Air Force One section in the museum. Uh, this is probably the. I'm not even sure if I went through this. I think I just buzzed the tower very quickly on this section. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's still a commercial jet, and I wasn't super excited to see that. <laughs> so I just kind of gave it a once over. I'm like, eh. But there's an Air Force One. It's only Air Force One and the President is on board. Uh, okay. There's another. Oh, that's such a tease, man. They, they can open up the back, but then be like, no, thou shalt not walk in the ramp. Come on, man. Might as well just keep the door closed then. I don't even know what plane this is. I can't quite tell. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, wait, no, I'm a dumb, all right, <laughs> scratch everything I just said. <laughs> I do remember this, all right, so you actually can walk up in this thing, because, yeah, all right, I saw the yellow sign and the kind of gates and thought that it was illegal, but no, nah, there's room on the right, room on the left, so it's enter on the right, do a UE in there, and come back, all right, I did walk in this thing, I, I apologize to the event planners. I do have a video of me walking through that, by the way, I will... Post it if I can find it. All right, don't know what that is. P8, maybe. So many pictures we got. Oh, I think I'm getting close to the end. All right. Yeah, because this was my way back to the front. So those are some rockets. Nice. Rocket engines. Yeah, I ran up the stairs. This is very close to the end. Okay, good, because it is 3.43 a.m. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Tell my mother. All right. Uh, more rockets.
rockets, rocket engines. Minuteman 2. I thought we were on Minuteman 3s. So this must be me. Second generation. No room for error. Uh, okay, I'm scanning, scanning, scanning. Each scenario took 34. Yeah, they tested these people very heavily. That's good. That's good. Feel free to pause and read. There's the mock up with the mannequins doing the Minuteman mission. Moving on. The Reaction Motors XLR99 rocket engine. No clue whatsoever what that is, what it powered. Look at that thing. Oh, it looks so complicated. It's incredible. You know, there's somebody out there who knows how the thing works. <laughs> I mean, like, not even from a high level, which I don't even understand how it works from a high level. I mean, there's somebody out there who knows what every single valve and tube and who knows what else is even in there. Spark plugs? I, <laughs> I don't know. Look at that thing. Incredible. Ah, this was the uh, nuclear box. Yeah, this was the locked box that had nuclear codes. Um... Yeah, the dual locks were for a, uh, I don't know the word, not redundancy. It kept one person from acting alone, essentially. It, prevent, it prevented uh, rogue warriors. Not, uh, so both pilots yeah, had to do their combo, and only they knew the combo. They did not share combos. All right. I think I got better view of the captions, so, yep, there they are. All right. This is a box from a B-52. Held secret codes needed to launch nuclear attacks. Wow. Codes called cookies or tickets anchored to the floor of the aircraft. Wow. I mean, like... No, never mind. Never mind. Moving on. <laughs> flash goggles. Yeah, so these goggles protected eyes from the intense flash of nuclear explosions. Yeah, well, how much is... How bright is a nuke? Like, I don't know, a thousand times brighter than the sun or something like that. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, there they are. Have some fancy sunglasses there. <laughs> Moving on. Looks like we got various reentry vehicles there. I'm going to go ahead and guess the one on the right has never been used. And the one on the left, or the one in the center, and probably the one on the left used there's the b-52 see the b-52's got curved areas so by, by the time they designed that thing they had enough computing power to model stealth i assume is what they were doing probably modeling modeling the radar cross-section signature and with curved areas in the 1970s they just couldn't do it um but by the time a B-2 was built, they had enough computing power to do it. And as a result, that thing, I'm sure, is very more aerodynamic. And, uh, man, it's just sexy. It's sexy. And I'm waiting. So B-2, so the B-21 is being revealed by Northrop on December 2nd, I believe it is. That's coming up. That is coming up quick. I'm pumped. I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, for the sake of the nation, I hope they knocked it out the park. I really do. I hope they killed it. We will see. I will be very interested to see what that thing looks like. Very interested. And there's more B-20. Uh, B-20. B-2 with the Air Force Mustang in the foreground. There's a bird of prey. So uh, if you were dil diligently reading your signs and placards like I asked you to, uh, one of them mentioned... It was the next evolution after the Bird of Prey, and there you go. That's the Bird of Prey. That's a pretty sick-looking aircraft. Uh, it's manned. You can't tell. There's somebody who sits in there. This was actually a precursor to the, um, oh, my gosh, the Phantom Ray. Yes. Uh, this thing came before the Phantom Ray. The Phantom Ray is completely unmanned. That's just a demonstration flying wing aircraft. Uh Look at those wingtips, though. Those suckers bend down. It's pretty cool. I don't know what that does. I guess it's probably a stealthy thing. You tell me. I don't know. 
Um, oh, that's the last one. That's it. This is the last picture. Wow. I was going to click the next one. All right, folks. It's <laughs> what? Two hours? Three hours, maybe? I'm dreading editing this because <laughs> I'm going to have to take out a lot of the audio and figure out when I scroll pictures and the whole thing. But uh, if you made it this far, wow, you need a gold star. Drop me a line in the comments if you made it this far. Um, code word foliage. <laughs> if you put code word foliage in the comments, I'm going to mail you a gold star. <laughs> Uh, because this is hours and hours of footage. I enjoyed it. Th this museum, uh, go. Uh, that's all I can say about it. I want to go back to Dayton. I never thought those words would come out of my mouth. I want to go to Dayton, Ohio to go back to this museum. I had no idea how big it was, how involved it was. Y you could, well, you, I can only speak for me. It'd take me a week probably to go through this thing fully and read everything and process everything. And that's just the inside. There's, so there's surrounding grounds, too. I was walking back to my car on the way out, and, you know, it's like they got statues over here and plaques over here, and they got outside static display models. I mean, yeah, I saw an A-10 outside at least, and I think a C-17 maybe. I mean, it, it's just incredible. And it was this place is packed to the gills, too. So I'm like, I'm already worried about the next generation of aircraft that this thing's going to house because I don't know where they're going to put it. They're going to have to build a new hangar. But uh, all that being said, incredible experience. Uh, please go to this museum. It's free. You just walk in. Um, incredible. There's so many aircraft. So many aircrafts in there. Uh, airframes, history. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Highly recommend it. Put Dayton on your vacation list. And uh, man, that's it. We're at the end. I love you guys. Um, probably got some diving videos coming up next. I'm trying to think. I'm going to be doing some diving in December. It's going to be cold. But a friend of mine asked me to fetch some patio furniture that blew into a lake. And uh, I'm going to be in her neck of the woods in December. So that's what we're doing. You know, I'm going to go part of the whole thing. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. I'm pumped to see what kind of treasures are under her dock but tell then folks enjoy the bird of prey enjoy all the airframes in here enjoy the technological advantage that I hope we still have <laughs> peace out